Greetings once again. Welcome to the 133rd session of the online Optum Learning Series OLS. And for today's session, we have with us uh, Madam Sarah Farrant. She is a graduate from the Cardiff University in the UK. She is a passionate practitioner. And because of her passion for her practice, it has uh, you know, led to a variety of collaborations, I would say. She has taken a lot of additional qualifications as well. And she is the leading national expert in terms of therapeutics as well as dry eye management. Not only that, she is also the UK ambassador for the TFOS, which is the Tear Flim and Ocular Surface Society. She also sits on the EXCO board of the BCLA and was on the council of the College of Optometrists for about 12 years. She is the chair of the Somerset Local Optical Committee and has been instrumental in a number of local initiatives, which is helping people in terms of access to a nationally recognized level of eye care. She has been lecturing internationally uh, on the topics of dry eyes as well as anterior segment. And uh, with that experience and working with the TFOS, definitely she is uh, a specialist in dry eye, I would say. And she is going to take us through a dry eye disease and a case-based review where she'll uh, take us through the whole channel of dry eyes. And uh, let me just uh, you know leave the screen time to you, ma'am. Thanks for the introduction, Fagri, in there. Uh, so I'd really just wanted to uh, use the opportunity today to, to talk to you all about how to make sure you can use the evidence base that's out there, use the information from JUS2 and from TFOS uh, and the wider research community in order to actually translate that into practical and meaningful interpretation uh, when you're actually having a look at your dry eye patients. So really just as a refresh, I'm sure many of you now uh, have come across the TVOS Jews 2 uh, definition of dry eye. And it's really important that we recognize it as a disease. Many patients, I think, still don't realize that, that, it, that it does have that, that category, if you like, uh, and dismiss it as, oh, it's just something I've got to put up with, which obviously just simply isn't true. Uh, and then obviously the, the other factors, the fact uh, that you get tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, uh, it is an inflammatory disease. And also, as we're understanding more and more, uh, that there are also uh, elements at play like neurosensory abnormalities that we mustn't uh, forget. So JUICE2 really came uh, uh, up with this algorithm, if you like, that uh, taught us a little about how to consider uh, our patients in, in clinic, in practice, whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic, and indeed filtering down to the, the different elements of, of what we should be looking for and what we should be considering when we arrive at our diagnosis of dry eye disease. And we also are better understanding the fact that dry eye disease uh, is mixed. Uh, so it's not just the category of either evaporative or aqueous deficient, but in actual fact, uh, there's often a bit of an amalgamation uh, of the, uh, the two sort of subtypes that we come across day to day. So if we think about the pathogenesis uh, of dry disease uh, and my own gland dysfunction, um, there's many things that, that drive the cycle, this vicious cycle that we often talk about. Uh, and the e sort of external components that sort of feed into that cycle that really cause the patients to then uh, be on this roundabout uh, and going round and round uh, with their tear film instability that's driving inflammation. Uh, and it's really about us in practice as clinicians, how we can actually break that cycle to stop the patient just going on that journey of just uh, reinforcing uh, that sort of cellular mechanism behind their, their dry eye disease. So TFOS Juice 2 also came up with uh, a sort of guide, as it were, a practitioner guide that really helps us uh, because it's so simple uh, on the face of it to do some uh, questions, uh, look at risk factor analysis uh, and do a series of diagnostic tests which allow us to arrive at the decision as to whether the patient is a dry eye candidate. 
And then indeed, once we have done so, working out what, what the subtype is and the, the severity uh, of their problems as well. So it's a really good user-friendly tool to use in clinic. Uh, and if you've not come across this or familiar with this, I'd strongly recommend that you take a look at the, the TFOS website to just understand uh, and read up around the, uh, the JUICE 2 report. So I'm really going to, to have a, a decent look now at, at a case I saw very recently in practice. And I deliberately chose one which wasn't unusual. It's, it's a very common you know, occurrence in, in my clinic. Uh, and I uh, really just wanted to really talk you through my mental processes and, and engagement that I have with a, pra- with a patient in practice as I go. Uh, so this guy... Mr. P, um, it was his first visit to my clinic. Uh, He's uh, 56 uh, and he's had issues for about 20 years uh, with with dry symptoms. Um, And as a result, he tried many, many different things. Uh, At the end of his tether, nothing had helped, was sort of assuming that there'd be absolutely nothing I could do either, uh, but thought of decided it was worth a try, uh, one last ditch attempt uh, to see what what could be done. Uh, So he He's quite symptomatic. He's getting gritty, burning sensations worse early in the morning and later in the evening. He's also more recently noticed that his eyes are are becoming sort of red rimmed. So his lid margins are looking quite red, too. Um, He's also started in the last couple of years getting some lid lumps especially on the left eye, uh, which are a bit uh, recalcitrant and and aren't seeming to to go. Um, He's tried antibiotics, he's tried possible steroid drops. um, And he, like a lot of people, has Googled his condition uh, and decided that IPL uh, might be uh, a viable option for him. So he's come in uh, to my dryer clinic to see what what options he's got. Um, Otherwise, nothing else remarkable. His health is good. He's not on medications uh, and he's never worn contact lenses. So as part of the assessment, I always uh, dish out uh, dry questionnaires. So I currently still use the DEQ5. Uh, and his score is 18, which would be indicative uh, of dry. Anything over six would indicate that. His vision is pretty good, but it does vary on blink. Again, a common issue when people have unstable tear films. Uh, and I use my Maya, my my dry diagnostic uh, device, to do a workup uh, on him and also measured his tear lab uh, to measure his osmolarity and recorded uh, 318 right and 334 left. So anything over 308 uh, is usually the, the cutoff point for uh, designating that individual as dry. The higher the number, the worse the problem. So when it comes to actually doing a, a diagnostic workup in, in practice, um, really it's a series of steps uh, and procedures that, that I'm taking to engage with the patient and work out the, the puzzle pieces, as it were, as to what's actually uh, going on. So we uncover the data uh, and I try to be methodical and use a sort of workup algorithm to, to achieve the, the data and therefore the diagnosis that I need. Uh, and that really revolves around starting to look at the blinking rate, the um, o- ocular protection index, and working that out uh, for the individual, measuring the osmolarity, and just having a look, just using white light on the slit lamp to just look at the eye uh, and, and just generally from afar gauge what's going on, measuring the tear meniscus, uh, the tear breakup time, uh, looking at the lid wiper, the part of the lid that's in touch with the uh, the surface of the eye, uh, and also taking a really good look at the lid margins as well. Then taking a look at the conjunctiva, looking for hyperemia, fold, staining, uh, any element that's uh, abnormal showing signs there. Uh, the corneal appearance as well, obviously, looking for any corneal anomalies. Uh, it's not infrequent in the clinic that I will see cases of corneal dystrophy uh, because that obviously tends to also dry, drive dry symptoms. Uh, so not forgetting to look for, for signs like that. Um, and also staining, obviously, but also the patterns of stain. So using fluorescein uh, to look at the corneal surface and, um, and uh, looking how the, the breakup pattern is uh, influenced by that too. Then taking up the lids, so looking at the lashes, the debris, uh, assessing what's going on there, what type of blepharitis uh, is present if there are flakes in the lashes. And then doing a a review of my Bowman glands, so having a really thorough look and assessing uh, things like the expressibility, 
the viscosity of the myobum coming out and the actual location on the mid margin of the glands as well. And all of that data really giving us this working diagnosis, which we use as our starting point to then engage with the patient, educate the patient and come up with a series of management strategies, both in the office and for them to do at home, which hopefully is going to get us the results we need. So uh, this is the results from my uh, Maya diagnostic device. Uh, on Mr. P. Uh, and what we see here uh, is the, the, the top image shows his non-invasive tear breakup time. Uh, so on his right eye, he had an average of about 10 seconds tear breakup. So that one's certainly not too bad. We, we try to aim for uh, anything over 10 if we can. Uh, the left eye uh, breaking up at about five seconds. So that one's seemingly worse on that scoring. Uh, but interestingly, his IBI, his interblink interval, i.e. just how quickly he blinks, uh, was recorded by the machine at only, only 1.2 seconds. So he's actually got quite a rapid blink rate. Um, um, which often helps to protect the cornea in case of dry eye from, from desiccation from drying out. In terms of the tear meniscus height, so our measuring the average uh, with the same machine, we got 0.24 and 0.29. Uh, so anything uh, of 0.2 or greater generally indicates uh, that there doesn't appear to be a, a significant aqueous deficiency present. So he uh, uh, doesn't look to have any issues with his aqueous production. And we imaged his lower uh, lids. Uh, this is mybography. So this is using infrared to have a look at the mybomium gland structure uh, and have a look at how uh, many of the glands have actually atrophied uh, at that stage. So uh, in his right lower lid, the Maya measured the atrophy, the gland loss at about 41% of his glands were already atrophied. Uh, in, the, in the left eye, uh, a, a little worse, 54% of his glands uh, were, were atrophied at that stage. And if you simply look at that in a bit more detail here, you can see um, the right lid, which appears on the left hand side of the screen. Uh, you can definitely see that there's more glands visible there. Uh, you can still see little patches where the, the glands are atrophied uh, and shrinking and, and getting shorter um, but you can see there are significantly more glands and longer glands visible than you can see uh, on the left lid. Often you do find in practice that you do get asymmetry between eyes, uh, that's a very common feature uh, of my bone gland uh, atrophy. So as we said already, the tear meniscus height really seemed fine, adequate. Uh, so it didn't already, it didn't, it seems to indicate, uh, indicate an obvious aqueous deficiency uh, in this case. So the tear breakup time, again, it, it clearly states that the left eye is the worst one. But as we've already seen, uh, the left eye also shows a uh, greater loss of meibomium glands. So that could uh, be uh, sort of a, a sign of that as well. From the point of view of his imaging, uh, so these are images that I took of um, the, the same patient. Uh, and you can see uh, in the top left image, just a generalized view. Um, so the first thing I'm really looking at when I just shine white light uh, on the eye surface is things like um, conjunctival hyperemia, lid margin hyperemia, telangiectasia, the little vessels that you get on the lid margin, uh, whether there's clear evidence of, uh, of debris crusting colorets in amongst the lashes. And obviously, whether there's anything, any anomalies on the cornea, such as dystrophies or ulceration or panis or you know, any just anything you can you can just see uh, as a starting point. Uh, so if you look at the bottom left image, you'll start to see uh, on that one um, that you can see one of the lid lumps that he was on about. So this is a recalcitrant calasian sort of uh, stuck and sat there in his lid, which had been there for a few months, uh, according to his history. Uh, and uh, also you can just start to see even on low magnification in that bottom left image there that he definitely has some signs of uh, debris and crusting within the, the lid margin that we're going to want to look at uh, in more detail. So when we start to zoom in a little, same patient, uh, and we start to have a look uh, at the buildup of that debris and, uh, in his lid margin, you can start to see it has a bit particular kind of few features. Uh, so the, the buildup of the, the crusting here um, is um, really what we call this cylindrical dandruff. Um, and these tend to be more a feature uh, of uh, Demodex form of blepharitis. 
Um, what you also see, there aren't a lot of sort of free flakes. So he doesn't have a lot of sort of flaking debris sort of hanging on to the lashes further down. Uh, also, you'll note there isn't a, an extensive amount of inflammation present along that margin. Um, but what he does have, if you look in the bottom left image here, um, are some uh, fairly dilated uh, telangiectasic vessels within the lid as well, just uh, away from the margin, as you can see there. So that's probably why he's noticing these sort of red rims that he described. So in practice, um, blepharitis, realistically, there's three main types we want to concern ourselves about. And the reason why it's useful to work out the type of blepharitis that a patient may have is because it helps you, obviously, in your management. The management of blepharitis is best done if it's tailored to the particular type of blepharitis that's there. Uh, so if you can work it out in clinic, it does allow you to be more specific and, and target your management more appropriately to that individual. Uh, so if you look at this table, you can see that the classic differences that, that you tend to see in practice. So Staphylococcal blepharitis tends to be more of a scaly, crusty, uh, dry sort of uh, appearance. Uh, and you do get uh, a fair amount of inflammation and redness uh, with this too. Often with staphylococcal, what happens is that you get um, sort of an ulcerative uh, effect at the root of the lashes. So if you remove the crust and the debris from the, the base of the lash, it sort of peels away and leaves a very raw, red raw sort of patch underneath this ulcerative appearance and that's quite uh, uh, a hallmark of staphylococcal. Um, Sebaric um, tends to be associated with other skin issues, dermatitis problems in the patient. Um, it looks more greasy and oily, um, a lot of flaky skin um, elsewhere in the brows, on the scalp. It tends to be found mostly in older patients and again not so much inflammation uh, as staphylococcal, so a bit less red uh, in those cases. With Demodex, um, as mentioned, you get these cylindrical dandruff uh, sort of collarettes around the, the lashes. These are really pathognomonic of the, the disease. Um, it's associated with rosacea. Uh, you can get things like lash loss with this. Um, and often one of the um, cases, it's one of those ca cases where if you have a patient that's tried lots of things and they're um, struggling with typical lid hygiene therapies, um, then quite often that is Demodex because it doesn't respond terribly well um, to, to normal lid hygiene therapies. So in these images, in the top left, uh, you can see an example of staphylococcal blepharitis. Um, so these are the sort of ulcerative collarettes that I was talking about, um, where you really get these sort of angry red raw patches, especially if you peel away the crusty parts. Um, the bottom left image there is uh, after therapy. Uh, so you can see um, this patient, I simply prescribed some chloramphenicol, which I create an ointment that I got them to rub uh, into their lids uh, for a couple of weeks four times a day uh, and you can see the the improvement uh, in the inflammation uh, and um, just the sort of drying up if you like of those ulcerative uh, cholerates as well. Uh, on the right hand side the image there shows uh, a um, seboric blepharitis so you can see in this one that it's um, much less angry and red and inflamed but you get quite a lot of this sort of flaky free debris uh, hanging around as well so that's uh, uh, an aid to differentiating the, the common types. So if we come back to Mr P our case uh, for the session um, then we've zoomed in a bit more now to have a, a bit more of a look at his uh, margins and you can see um, in the top left image here you can see quite a lot of what we call telangiectasia so these are these tiny little sort of thread vessels that you get along the mid lid margin these tend to happen um, in more chronic cases of mgd um, and you can see also um, the effect um, on the right hand image that it has on the upper two again these classic telangiectasia uh, and these are really quite dilated uh, as you can see and again that's just uh, showing that also the telangiectasia sort of around the the uh, calasian recalcitrant calasium so these images show his uh 
lack of staining, if you like. So earlier when I mentioned that his interblink interval was very rapid, so he was quite a, a, a frequent blinker, um, one thing that does tend to signify is that you're protecting the cornea. So um, frequent blinkers with very short IP, IBIs tend not to get much staining. So they don't tend to show desiccation of the cornea. Um, and if you think about that, it's very logical, simply because they're not allowing the cornea to dry out before uh, they're blinking. So even if they've got a short tear breakup time, if their blink rate is even shorter, then they're not really going to get to the stage where their cornea is actually suffering as a result of that poor breakup. If we then take a look on the right hand side here, uh, this is me squeezing his lid margins. Now, I am an avid squeezer of lid margins, so I like to do a lot of expression in my clinics. Uh, and I use expression both as a diagnostic uh, in Mr. P's case here. So I need to know what's going on uh, with those glands. So I give them a squeeze to ascertain um, how easy it is to express uh, what's coming out of, of which glands uh, and the viscosity of the expression of the mybum as well. So, so interestingly, in his case, you can see the mybum here actually looks fairly good. Good. So um, it's slightly cloudy, but it's really quite runny. So that's a, a, a very low grade uh, meibomian gland disease at this stage. So when we think about meibomian gland dysfunction, there's an overall prevalence uh, in the general population over 40 of between 38 and 68 percent. So it's incredibly common. Uh, and the vast, vast bulk of uh, dry disease that we see uh, in clinic uh, is derived uh, wholly or in part because of this problem. Uh, and there are different mechanisms for uh, patho pathophysiological mechanisms for why um, this can happen. So eyelid inflammation, you get conjunctival inflammation, the cornea gets damaged, microbiological changes occur, uh, and the dry disease itself is really a result of all of these uh, and tear film instability. So when we take a look at the glands uh, in MGD, um, what tends to happen is a, a series of things. Um, you get dilation of the actual gland structure, a distortion on mybography, so that the glands start to look tortuous, uh, a shortening of the glands where um, you're getting atrophy in part of the glands, complete dropout where the entire gland uh, dies off and atrophies, uh, and the telangiectasia that we saw in Mr. P earlier. Uh, and it's important to bear in mind there are, again, Again, different types of my own gland dysfunction. Um, so you can get um, the classic hyposecretory, the most common that we see a lot in practice, but also you can get hypersecretory states to the glands where uh, obviously you're just getting far more mybrum production than you'd expect normally. And one of the main reasons why I consider it really, really important to squeeze the glands um, is because uh, of the um, differential between obvious and non-obvious MGE. So it is not unusual um, that you'll look at what appears to be a fairly healthy lid margin. There's not extensive inflammation. The gland orifices look fine. Uh, uh, and yet when you squeeze and press on the, the actual glands and express the mybum, uh, the mybum can come out uh, very viscous and, and it's a sure sign of, of a non-obvious uh, mybum gland dysfunction. So I do think it's really, really important uh, to, to become a squeezer uh, with this uh, diagnostic workup for MGD. So when we consider the glands themselves, uh, what we understand uh, from MGD and what, uh, what happens is that uh, in a healthy gland, you have just the little acini and the, the, um, the mybum secreted into the duct which then flows freely out of the orifice uh, onto the lid margin and then gets uh, pumped with blinking uh, onto the, uh, the front of the, the tear film. Uh, so blinking is really important um, in my bone gland disease uh, because uh, incomplete blinks or poor blinking habits doesn't allow that same pump mechanism to occur uh, to engage and pump actively the mybum out of the orifice. So what can happen? with dysfunction is that the orifice gets sealed shut. Um, and then what happens is that the uh, pressure in the gland rises as the mybum is still being produced uh, from the acini. Uh, and then to a point, the glands can dilate to take the burden of some of that pressure, but then they reach a critical point where they can't 
manage with that increased pressure anymore uh, and then the glands atrophy and die off and obviously that's an irreversible pattern. So when we do mybography, um, it's useful to have a, a look at the, the, the glands and be able to, to, to grade them. And we tend to use Hycopult's uh, MyberScale uh, to do this. Um, and dropout can be uh, either um, distal, proximal or central. So it can occur anywhere uh, within the gland. Um, and it helps you to understand exactly where the patient is in their disease process. So even if they've got really thick mybum that, that's very viscous and difficult to get out, um, they might not have uh, any dropout yet. Uh, and obviously you want to try and aggressively manage them before they start to lose glands. Whereas if you've got a case where they've pretty much lost all of their glands, um, then there's, there's not necessarily as much driver for you to want to try and look after glands that don't exist so it, it's a really good uh, uh, indicator of kind of where they are um, to show the patient this as well is a very visceral uh, way of engaging with with patient education so it, it, they can see uh, and understand what's happening structurally with their glands which often helps to to motivate them uh, when you're needing them to engage with their management at home uh, and we do know to a point that um, gland dropout does occur naturally as an age-related process. So it will be happening without uh, active myeloma gland dysfunction, but never at the same rate. So the way I tend to try and grade uh, cases of MGD in practice, I like to keep it as simple as I can. So I tend to operate across the board uh, a, a typical zero to four grading scheme for, for more or less all the things I'm, I'm grading when I'm reviewing a dry eye case. Uh, so in terms of glands, um, zero would be that all glands are patent and it's clear and runny when you express. Uh, but in Mr. P's case, he had uh, obviously a little bit uh, of uh, clouding uh, with his mybum, but it was uh, runny. So I would grade his, his mybum uh, as grade one. But as you saw earlier in his mybography scores, it, he has much worse atrophy than we would perhaps expect from a, a grade one uh, viscosity. This image here uh, of a different patient just shows you as well um, the individuality, if you like, of the disease. So you don't necessarily expect uh, two adjacent glands to be uh, showing the same level of viscosity. So you do get variation across a single eyelid uh, between grade one and grade four um, because it is almost a gland or a, a disease of individual glands so it's important to to look at all the glands present uh, and assess them individually as well uh, so this is just uh, an image showing you um, a, a gland of mole here so uh, when you express the the mybum obviously you're putting quite a bit of pressure on the lip, lip margin uh, and in doing so um, you'll express other glands as well so this is an example of a, a, a gland of mole there so this is a, a patient of mine that has a hyper secretory state uh, uh, of MGD. So when I see him, uh, he produces a, a vast excess uh, of very thick mybum uh, that we uh, that we remove periodically. So when we think about the location of the orifices. Uh, uh, on the mybum glands and the lib margin, um, the tear prism sits just behind uh, the orifices themselves. Uh, and as a consequence, when the mybum is uh, secreted in a normal way, it then flows right onto the surface of the tear film because it's uh, sort of in adjacent or in contact with that part uh, of the tears. Uh, and when um, you, um, studies have shown when people get older um, that you can naturally find that Marx's line, which is the, the, the junction between um, carotenized skin, the sort of mucocutaneous junction and the mucous membrane, um, actually migrates forward with age um, away from the cornea. Uh, and the problem with that is that slowly what can happen uh, is that Marx's line will engulf the myeloma gland orifices. Uh, and then uh, the issues anatomically are that the oil, the, the mybum is secreted into the aqueous phase uh, of the tear film uh, and then contributes less effectively uh, to the lipid layer. And this effect is irreversible. Uh, you tend to see it more in dry eye cases, but it's a, an age related problem full stop. 
Uh, so it is also important to have a look for this uh, in clinic uh, to see the effect uh, of um, those changes. Uh, so these images on the left, uh, you can see uh, my bone gland orifice, uh, which is the, the small dot uh, highlighted with fluorescein there. Um, and this one has not been engulfed by Marx's line. So this is sitting anatomically in the correct location, if you like. Uh, and the one on the right here has been engulfed by Marx's line. So it's a different gland on the same uh, patient. Uh, and the problem with that gland is that it's going to be secreting its mybum uh, into the wrong part of the tears. So... It's also important to bear in mind whether these changes that you're seeing in the glands are cicatricial. Uh, so cicatricial MGD can um, be primary, uh, but it's much more commonly associated with things like pemphigoid, chemical injuries, atopy, rosacea. Uh, so cicatricial changes tend to stretch the orifice. Uh, so you see a sort of thinning or stretching of the uh, opening of the gland that, that elongates around uh, the back of the lid margins and they get dragged possibly posteriorly so it's important to to look out for this uh, as well so if we go back to mr p uh, so here i am uh, using uh, what we call a golf club spud uh, and this is a procedure called debridement so this uh, is designed to uh, remove the keratinized debris uh, and uh, that tends to obstruct the the gland orifices so to help in the process of keeping the glands patent uh, by stopping the the ducts from getting too blocked um, the bottom left image shows uh, staining with lysamine green, but also quite nicely highlights lip cough, uh, lid parallel conjunctival folds. And these are frequently seen in case of dry eye because they're, they're as a, they result uh, from frictional forces on the conjunctiva, which tends to loosen it uh, and it sort of gathers uh, temporally uh, on the lid margin there. Uh, and on the right hand image, you can see here um, that he's got quite significant what we call lid wiper epitheliopathy, uh, where you've got a lot of lysamine green staining on that margin where you're getting friction or damage uh, from the rubbing uh, each time he's blinking uh, and this of the lower lid um, and you can also see how just about uh, this is staining um, posteriorly to Marx's line here you can see that just about some of these uh, my bone gland orifices are still anatomically uh, in front of um, the mucocutaneous junctions. So he's got uh, just about coping with the, the better anatomical position uh, of those glands. So once we've had a look, you know, done our sort of diagnostic workup, looked at the, um, the surface, the breakup time, uh, and we've started to gauge whether we think it might be aqueous or evaporative in origin, um, it's really important to try and grade the severity. So JUICE2 again gives us some guide guidance on how to go about doing this uh, in a clinical setting. Um, and once we think we know uh, sort of what we're dealing with, the danger is that the patients often think they know too. Um, and um, it's uh, always uh, the internet and, and Google are, are great resources uh, used in the right way, but often patients come in uh, misinformed uh, and, and misguided about what, what, they're, what they need to do and, and what their condition is. So in terms of um, in practice, it's definitely best to try and diagnose uh, or come up with a working diagnosis uh, as accurately as you can um, and recognising what's likely to be going on or um, what the major cause is likely to be in, um, in that patient's case and then crafting a, a plan for them. Uh, so in Mr P's case, um, the working diagnosis was obviously a drier disease, which was definite, which was confirmed uh, with osmolarity too. Um, the uh, bulk of his issues were evaporative uh, in origin. His aqueous uh, function looked fine. Uh, so uh, my bone gland dysfunction uh, and uh, chalasians and demodex blepharitis. Um, so once we've now got our working diagnosis, we've got to come up with our plan of how we're going to manage him. So I really divide the management plan into two parts, an in-office part uh, and the at-home regime. So uh, again, you can take reference here to the TFOS Juice 2 report because it does give you some guidance on the options that we've got uh, available, evidence-based options, uh, in order to help manage these patients. So there's four different steps, if you like. They don't have to be used in sequence, um, but it's just generalised guidance that's really, really useful as an evidence base for how we should be managing them. So 
in this case, uh, in Mr. P's case, uh, I um, came up with sort of five things I needed to do uh, with him uh, in my office. Um, so education uh, is absolutely one of the most important things. So getting the patient to take ownership of their disease, to understand their disease uh, and getting a them on board and engaged with the plan uh, is a definite important element of their management because if they do understand it and they do engage with it then they're um, they're going to be um, much in a much better position to actually uh, do the things you're asking them to do at home so I do spend a long time with a patient getting them uh, on board with what's going on. Um, so I expressed uh, completely all four lids. Uh, so once I'd sort of done my, if you like, diagnostic expression, um, the, uh, you're then on to therapeutic expression where we're kind of clearing it all out and helping keep them open as well. Um, then gland debridements, as I showed you earlier, uh, that's really to keep um, the keratinized buildup uh, away from the orifices to keep the glands patent. Uh, we also engaged in microblepharoxfaliation. Uh, so I have uh, a couple of devices that allow me to remove all the buildup, uh, the uh, debris from the blepharitis, in his case, the, the demodex blepharitis, reduce the bacterial load uh, and reduce the uh, level of inflammatory triggers on the lid margins. I also uh, decided to undertake uh, IPL intensive pulse light therapy and low level light therapy uh, as a comp combined procedure uh, for his meibomian gland dysfunction and also to help potentially with those recalcitrant chalasians. Uh, so this is the same patient, Mr. P, um, after I'd done micro exfoliation. So you can see um, immediately after that he's got a much, much clearer lid. Uh, there's none of those uh, dandruff, syndrome dandruff, uh, the colorets that you could see in the earlier slides. So also there's emerging evidence that uh, using things like low level light therapy, um, as I have on my IPL device, uh, can help things like recalcitrant chalasia. So this is something I'm doing more and more in my clinics when I see these kind of patients. So this is the patient um, using the um, low-level light therapy mask uh, in the clinic uh, as part of their um, treatment strategy. And then devising an at-home management plan. So um, what we, we did was um, engage the patient uh, on board with this journey as well. So explained um, the, a series of things I wanted them to do. Um, and it is important to a point not to try to make this too complicated. Uh, so sometimes I will maybe start off with perhaps only one or two things if I think the patients uh, are going to struggle with compliance. Uh, but in his case, he was very keen to do uh, everything uh, we could uh, at this stage to, to begin his journey uh, into management. So warm compress was advised uh, every day, uh, taking some omega-3, using a hypochlorous spray, uh, using a general lid hygiene uh, uh, in, in his at-home therapy every day, um, but then using a stronger um, tea tree oil-based uh, lid wipe uh, once a week to help with the demodex component of his blepharitis, and then using a good lubricant drop, um, or something in, this, in his case which had a, a lipid nanoemulsion just to help with the evaporative component of his dry eye disease. Uh, and that's the, the that was the plan. So uh, in terms of getting him to engage with that, we wrote it all down. Uh, we give very clear um, instructions on each element of his at home treatment uh, and make sure he has a copy. So we usually email them to the patients um, and we also give them a point of contact so that they can engage with the practice if they have questions or queries about uh, any of their at home therapies. Uh, and then as a typical rule, I would tend to see the patient um, once they're engaged with this therapy on something like a four to six month cycle. Uh, and then we can repeat various processes and cleaning and squeezing and things as, as appropriate. So at this stage, I'm going to hand back and uh, see if there are any questions that anyone wants to ask. I'm going to get Fagarid into come back yeah. on yeah yeah so thank you so much uh, ma'am i think that was wonderful you took us through uh, one case but then you know you you explained what was going on and i think that's really important uh, the anatomical references which we need to look for i think that was something which was a new learning for all of us thank you so much
Ma'am, just that one thought which comes to my mind is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you did clearly mention that compliance is something uh, which we are always worried that whether, uh, you know, the patient is uh, going to follow or not follow. Is there any uh, tricks or, you know, some tips what, uh, you know, you would like to share uh, so that we can see that compliance has been maintained? I, I know you said that you email the list to the, pair, uh, the patient and you give it in writing as well. Uh, but is there anything you would you would uh, you know stress upon to make sure that practitioners can get a compliant patient? I think the 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 key thing is getting them engaged. So that I, it's why uh, in my con- in, in the consulting room, I I probably allow about a third of my time for the process of education and onboarding the patient. So that would be showing them the data, showing them the images, uh, showing them all those anterior segment um, sort of slight, you know, so that they can really see what's going on um, so that they understand, you know, as best they can what what's driving this. And therefore, you know, they, I think the problem is some of the therapies do seem a little sort of home remedy-esque you know when you say right lie down with a mask and do and they think god really you know um so i think that you know to to get them to understand the mechanism of why they're doing it is one of the most important things but but regular contact as well so not just you know giving them the what they've got to do and and sort of sending them out and never planning on seeing them again so um so we in the uk um have um things called direct debit schemes because this is all done on a private basis for us um but what we do is we get people to um engage with schemes um so that they they sort of pay into a scheme every month and and then they come back in for care and they you know so so it sort of encourages loyalty and re- retention because they're aware they need to come in for for regular appointments so we make sure we communicate them with them regularly um and we make sure they understand they have a point of contact they understand that it's the beginning of a journey, not the end of a journey, uh, and just make sure they have all the information they need, really. That's right. Yeah, I think this is really important by, uh, I mean, the good point which you also mentioned is conveying to the patient and making sure that they are on board with you. Uh, that that builds up the compliance percentage, and I think they should be aware of what's happening and uh, not letting them know each things in details. That's that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. There was one uh, one. I, I mean, the last slide. It was uh, one of the treatment you mentioned. Six over seven. Is it probably six times? A six day? six out of seven days. Yeah. So six <laughs> days a week. Yeah. <laughs> so so in his case. Um, uh, I've got my little girl with me now. <laughs> In his case, um, my decision was uh, to to give him generalized lid hygiene sort of six days. And then on the seventh day, if you like to give him quite intense therapy with the, the tea tree oil based um, derivatives so that we can sort of hit, hit the Demodex a bit more aggressively, um, but not do that every single day. That's right. Yeah. And... Uh... Will the mebobian glands uh, recover after the IPL treatment? Uh, anything you would like to add on here? No. So, so when, when you do mybography and you see the atrophy within the gland structure, that the the atrophied glands are not going to recover. So they are gone um so if if you have a case um in in clinic where um most of their glands are already gone it is pointless doing ipl you know because it's not gonna you know get those those disappeared glands to 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 suddenly regrow again um but um therefore it's not suitable for everyone with mgd you have to be quite specific on kind of who you're targeting for that but with any of the therapies um once you've got gland atrophy that's that's irreversible that's right and you know so this is again a very commonly asked question all the time like you know in terms of primary eye care where uh, things like ipl and uh, low light uh, therapies are not available in some parts of the world um, mm-hmm. how, how would you uh, recommend at least to start, you know, uh, is there anything you would like to give a takeaway here if we do not have IPL or no light therapy? What should we be doing? 
Absolutely. And and to be honest, you know, in, in the UK, I'd say um, most practitioners don't use IPL and low level light. You know, it's it's not common uh, you know, in here either. Um, so I, I think the key things are following um, as much of the evidence base as you can in terms of um, making sure that you're getting them to do a, a good warm compress on a very regular basis. Uh, and, uh, and I do find that um, in my own clinics, I've been doing manual gland expression and debridement for many many years uh, and doing that on a periodic basis um, so all you need to do that obviously is a, a pair of um, my bone gland forceps and a and a little bit of, of, of training and a, uh, and a desire to squeeze <laughs> and then you can uh, get really quite good results you know just using those kind of therapies um, the IPL is nice but but I mean certainly in the UK it, it's not that cheap for the patients so you do also get a, a significant percentage um, not being in a position to to do it and engage with it either that's right yeah and uh... Yeah, another question about Imodex. So it is actually classified, you know, as anterior and posterior. Do you think that it would require different types of management or would you do something different if it is anterior versus the posterior in terms of clinical use? So by that, I, I assume Kay is, is saying that um, you can get Demodex within the myeloma glands as well. Um, so um, I tend not to use the sort of anterior-posterior um, terminology these days. I, I, I consider blepharitis to be, if you like, anterior blepharitis. But certainly if, if you have Demodex uh, within the lid margin, um, then obviously there's speculation that there could be um, uh, some... Uh, Demodex as well in the my bone gland uh, orifices um, and in, indeed in the glands too. But um, it's it's quite difficult. I know the research is still, um, I think, a little uncertain as to whether you actually do get uh, Demodex residing physically in the glands. Um, but certainly my management um, from um, that sort of angle would be the same. So if I see Demodex blepharitis anteriorly uh, uh, in the, the follicles, then I'm just going to, to treat that with some sort of um, derivative of tea, uh, tea tree to just try and kill the mites. But um, obviously in, in recent times, there's also been um, some speculation as, as to whether that could potentially harm the myeloma glands as well. Um, so whether doing uh, applying tea tree could have some effect on the glands. So I think it's a, a balance that we've got to strike. Um, and that's often why I don't go all in and use tea tree derivative aggressively, because I think it is important, but you 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 need to control the Demodex population. But A, you don't need to wipe out every single mite that's there. That's not really, you don't need to aim for that. Um, if you're just reducing the number, reducing that, um, you know, um, that load um, and the, the bacterial load that they carry, then that's going to help to to drive improvement and control over the condition. All right, great. And another question here is, would manual expression of the lead margin be an effective tool in identifying the degree of uh, the myeloma gland dysfunction. Yeah. So, say for example, if you don't have access to infrared, so you can't do myography, um, just ha getting yourself a little pair of my bone gland forceps and squeezing really, really does help you to understand. Um, because if you know the viscosity of the mybum that's present, you can definitely start to um, tell you know, the severity of the, the immediate problem. Obviously, what you can't tell is the kind of longevity outcomes. So you don't know if they've got a lot of atrophy in their glands if, if you're doing it that way. But to a point you will will have a feel for it because obviously an atrophy glands won't secrete anything. Um, so if you squeeze loads and absolutely nothing comes out, um, you know, the, the chances are that, you know, a proportion of those glands are, are, are atrophic and, and gone. Um, so you can get a, a bit of a feel for it doing that. Um, that said though, even with, um, a slit lamp uh, without having um, infrared capability, you can, if you look, sort of start to differentiate uh, a sort of slightly paler white gland versus a, a more red defunct gland in the lid margin. So even just with white light and a bit of a look and, you know, you can usually start to see when you know what you're looking for, whether there's a gland there and, and you know, whether there's lots of atrophy or not. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah. What's the association of filamentary keratitis with uh, MGD? Is it possible that these patients would have filamentary keratitis and anything you would like to comment on? Yeah, so obviously with, with filamentary keratitis, fundamentally you get a change in the um, the properties of the mucus, so the tear film, uh, and you get that change accompanied with uh, uh, dry patches on the cornea. So if there's any sort of punctate stain or desiccation on the corneal surface, um, then you get the, the adherence of the, the strands. Um, so it, it's they're, they're definitely related because it's just part of the bigger picture of, of dry eye disease. And as we know, 80 plus percent of people with dry eye disease have MGD at, at the core of their issue. Um, so filamentary keratitis um, in, in its own right has a, a, a few specific management strategies. So obviously um, you want to remove the filaments. So I just use a, very, a fine pair of jeweler's forceps and literally just pick them off the cornea. Um, and then um, I use something called eye lube uh, in in, uh, in the clinic, which helps to um, it's a mucolytic, so it breaks down the, the the strands of mucus, if you like, to to help stop them adhering to the the cornea, and that works quite well. But fundamentally, in these cases, you need to manage the bigger picture of their dry eye disease as well. So if they're presenting acutely with filament, filamentary keratitis, um, I'll manage their immediate issue, but then I'll strongly encourage them to actually start to manage and engage with the more deep-rooted dry eye disease as well. All right. Yeah, great. A couple of more questions here, uh, ma'am. Uh, I think this comes again from the case where uh, about the warm compression, probably you would want to reinitiate that. Uh, we did suggest that five times a day for two weeks, but it was seven on seven. So uh, just ignoring all this, I mean, what's your strategy? Warm compress should be done every day or do you want to give them some breaks in between uh, in a week or something like that? Would you like to add on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so to me, five, five times a day sounds a lot. Um, if we're talking about Calasian cases, uh, you know, uh, alone, um, and if the patient is committed and keen and the Calasian is quite fresh, um, then yes, I'd usually say warm compression three times a day in those cases. Um, th this guy's Calasian was very long standing. It was required, it wasn't going to budge however much warm compress we were doing. So the, the warm comp compress strategy for him was all about his generalized myeloma gland dysfunction. And for that, again, it's the balance of compliance. So if you tell someone to do something very frequently, they're probably going to be less compliant overall with the regime. So, um, so in his case, for generalized MDD, um, once a day is my general recommendation and trying to maintain the regularity of doing that every day, you know, indefinitely. Um, and um, on, on um, the question there, it says five times a day for two days in review. Um, I don't think after two days, you're going to get any real difference. Um, bear in mind, this is, um, you know, if it's if it's a clasia that you're trying to treat, um, then it's going to take usually at least a week or more um, to really get get anywhere with that. So I wouldn't usually do only do something for, for two days. I'd, I'd you know, take a much longer sort of viewpoint and perspective on, on how we're going to manage it. And obviously, even more so with MGD, because it's going to take literally months. So usually, I, I will warn the patients that they're not going to feel better tomorrow. Uh, they're not going to feel better next week. It's going to likely take at least two to four months before they really feel any shift in their symptoms when they're engaged with their regime. So uh, it's about managing their expectations as well, because so often, they come in feeling let down and, and uh, feeling that nothing has worked because they've tried something for a, uh, I did hot compress for a week, it didn't work. And then I tried blepharitis management for a week, it didn't work. And fundamentally, the problem with that is that they're just not giving it a chance. So, you know, it's explaining, engaging, again, coming all the way back to that patient education and the importance of them understanding that so that they understand that, that they've got to do these things. It's got to be long term. It's going to take time. That's right. All right. And, uh, you know, on the same lines of uh, giving compression, warm compression, we might probably have patients who have, uh, uh, you know, having papillaries uh, where we see on the upper lips. And would you recommend them to do warm and cold compresses simultaneously in any case? And if yes, 
how would you uh, advise or would you not do that <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really tough one isn't it? <laughs> because you're going okay well what what i meant to do is warm compress for this and cold compress for that so uh what do i do um and it's uh, it is a challenge and i think it's a, if they have suddenly developed some sort of allergic issue um and they've got billy then um i i think what i tend to do is tell them okay well stop with your dry eye management you know we can pick that up in the future we can re- reassert that you know in the future whereas if they've got papillae to me that's the more acute problem you know so that's the more i need to fix this now problem and so what i tend to do is say well i'm not i don't really feel that it's right to tell them do a cold compress and then do a hot compress because that just seems bananas mm-hmm. um so i will say to them okay well pause on this management for for the next couple of weeks do your cold compress or you know if that, if that's the you know, feels appropriate manage the allergy give them the drops you know manage that side of it and then once that element settled then we'll restart so um do the same thing if pa- patients for example um particularly the atopic patients will sometimes get flare-ups of their dermatitis and things like that so if, if they're doing regular hot compress and they're sort of wondering whether that's flaring up their dermatitis pause that treat the acute problem Set, settle that down and then resume what you were doing you know originally again that's right and uh, one question comes up here uh, this is again something which is a very common question which we normally get is we all understand that uh, dry eyes do aggravate sometimes with contact lens wear and you know you might have a combination of uh, uh these two so any takes on that would you uh, recommend them to stop wearing the lenses or uh, you know if dry eye is associated with contact lenses is there anything you would specifically do in those patients it it depends on the patient is i guess the annoying answer um because obviously if if the patient is a keen contact lens wearer and wants to keep up uh, some element of wear um then what i will typically do is say okay well let's start engaging with the dry eye managing that problem and maybe ease right off your contact lens wear for now um and then again be realistic so if they have got significant dry eye disease it's unlikely that they're necessarily going to wear um their contact lenses comfortably every day for 14 hours you know so it's again educating them that right well once we've got the dry eye more engaged more under control we've had maybe 3 or 4 months of therapy then we can rethink about the contact lens strategy and maybe get you in a better material or a different modality or you know and just start to strategize sort of how you're going to try and harmoniously bring the two together um because yeah there is definitely uh, an association as as you know with contact lens and dry eye disease and and the discomfort and the issues that that brings so i i think first and foremost start to manage one problem and then depending on how they respond and how they engage with that you can then plan on how you're going to reintroduce uh the other aspect of of care and management so usually i would pause their contact lens wear for a bit deal with the immediate problem and then try oh i've got another child and then try to start to really just engage reintroduce their contact lens thanks thanks abby um reintroduce their contact lens in in a sensible way uh, as i can right. okay just one last question sorry i'm not going to hold you uh, for too long uh, <laughs> it's just about the follow up schedule so somebody has asked that uh, do you have a follow up regimen schedule uh fixed for patients uh one is when they are into the treatment and let's say they they are treated out of dry eye disease is there any follow up schedule which you would recommend during and after the treatment i'm doing a talk mm-hmm. okay so be quiet um so usually what i would do is uh, it sounds in a way fairly unusual but i would tend to have quite a prolonged follow up so i would d- do all of that work up and give them that that structure and that plan um and then not see them for at least 4 to 6 months okay because if i see them in 2 weeks they're going to hope that their eyes will be better in 2 weeks and they're going to come back to me and go but it's not better and at, at the 2 week mark i'm not going to have any other 
strategies to do with them at that point that's going to make any difference compared to two weeks before. So, so I don't rush the follow up realistically, unless there's something else going on, like an ulcer or I've given them steroids or whatever. But as a general rule, I put them on a course, explain it, tell them why I'm just going to see them in four to six months, and then tend to you know, use that as my sort of um, intervals. And once you know that they have been treated, for, uh, you know, once you saw them after four to six months, and probably it's gone for two years, and now they seem to be fine. Would that continue uh, for for quite some time or you would increase the frequency? Let's say I see you every year or something like that. Um, it depends on the patients. So most of them, I'd say the vast, vast bulk of them are quite happy to maintain uh, um, a roughly a six month cycle because at that six month appointment, I'm maintaining their gland. You know, so I'm squeezing, I'm cleaning, I'm micro exfoliating, I'm doing all these kind of maintenance things. So um, I tend to use the, the dentist analogy. So yeah, I tend to say to them, right, this I'm going to become like your eye dentist here. You know, I'm going to regularly see you, clean you, squeeze stuff out, get rid of stuff, reduce bacteria, load you know and and actually it's quite a good analogy because people often understand that they go to the dentist regularly it's a maintenance thing that then has long-term beneficial effects so so i often describe it in that way um to, to get them on board and again using things like the the kind of payment schemes that we have um allows me to sort of keep the momentum going with the the strategies of of good patient care um but but again I don't tend to have a problem with getting people to come back in because as they start to improve, they, they kind of crave it. You know, they, they sort of, it's been interesting with, with COVID because obviously a lot of people's appointments have, have you know, gone over the, the six month timeline. And so many of them have said, gosh, you know what? I got to six months and I needed you. And I felt like, yeah, and 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 you kind of go, oh, right, okay. So like they've had two months of less comfy eyes because two months ago I should have been doing the maintenance. And and it's been quite interesting to hear that in lots and lots of cases where you suddenly realise that actually six months is probably quite a good interval because much longer than that, people start do start to, to deteriorate again. That's right. Yeah, so I think that analogy is good. I think use that maintenance therapy. It's going to be... No, we, we can't say it's going to be lifelong, but it's going to be a maintenance therapy and we would like to see you every six months, even though you're feeling better, but we need to do that maintenance to let you feel even more better, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think with that, thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for doing this and, you know, taking us through the case and explaining and uh, again, it's I, I do understand it's Sunday afternoon, your kids are waiting for you, so I'm not going to take much of your time. Thank you so much. Okay. No problem. You're very, very welcome. To the attendees, uh, uh, we do have a session planned uh, next weekend. I'm just going to put up the poster here. And if you are interested, please do join us. Uh, the session is about uh, digital eye strain. And you can ask uh, whatever questions you have uh, about digital eye strain. It's an FAQ about digital eye strain. And are we sure what is it? Thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. Take care. Uh, be safe and I hope to see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. No problem. Take care, Pakaridin. Bye. <laughs>